United States submarine base at Key West, Florida. A dispatch that quoted President Truman's press secretary, Charles Ross, as saying that President Truman has no knowledge of any secret project by this government that would give substance to the existence of such objects. Ross also said that both the Air Force and the Navy deny that such Hi. Hi. Um, off the top, before we get into intros, I made a note about some YouTube comments we've received. Yes. <laughs> I forgot, yeah. Um, if you would go ahead and pull them up, because I forgot to copy their usernames. But I specifically took a screenshot and sent them to you, so I wouldn't have to say any usernames. Oh, well, that's crazy, because you still have to. I, um, first off, let's say we objected to being on YouTube for almost the entirety of this podcast existence, right? Mostly because we said we'll never be on camera, even though we're on camera right now looking at each other, and we yeah. are every time we record, uh -huh. and it is being filmed, and that video is exported with our audio, but we just choose to drag it into the trash can. Yep. Um, and you know what? That's fine, and I stand by our stance with that because... Um, Voices get enough scrutiny. I don't need you to also see me on a Monday night. It's not good. And it's not. this is my safe space. And I don't want to like have to be aware of what I'm doing when we're doing this. It's just too I, much. I don't want people to see what I look like mm -hmm. at an angle that I have not carefully curated. Yeah. And scrutinized yeah. in a still photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not there yet because no. I am still, uh, if I'm still in the AA version of accepting that I cannot change what I look like. Yeah. And I, but I'm not ready to accept that. Yeah. I haven't made it past um, step one in the yeah. 12 step program yeah. for sure. Yeah. The, uh, the 12 step program of just, being unfortunate looking. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I, and I'm just like so sick of being perceived. To me, there's almost a magic to just being a voice in the ether. And unfortunately, some of you do see us online um, and that's your fault and your problem and your burden to carry, not mine. Mm -hmm. um, but all this to say that we did not expect or want to be on YouTube, but we are now for whatever reason. Um, and Because uh, I clicked the... Uh I clicked the integration option in Podomatic. Because Chelsea's getting excited about integrations. So that's why we're on YouTube. Yep. And it's honestly been fun so far. Um, the people who are leaving comments on all of our videos. Hi, how are you? Um, you have also reminded me that we are on YouTube because there were two of you who commented on the most recent episode about the cussing. And would you read it, Chelsea? Yeah, so uh, the Gnosticism episode um one from musketeer man i'm seven minutes in and i have to tell you how refreshing it is to hear all that cussing <laughs> and the other one uh cj shine 7984 i love the swearing it makes it better and then happy face with the tongue out eh, and then a happy face wink Oh, and then See, the other one said, uh, please don't go to church anymore. So we aren't. Okay, that's, we aren't. Don't worry. <laughs> we, all right. Don't worry. Um, and those two comments reminded me that on YouTube, you cannot cuss within the first 15 or 30 seconds of an episode. And they consider cussing even as inclusive as damn and hell. So I have a feeling that we as a podcast are <laughs> low-key shadow banned forever. But I was... Um, it made me realize how cussing right off the bat is special and unique and how, yeah. yes, it will prevent us from being monetized ever. Sure. But that's not why we're here in the first place. You and know, you know what not being monetized means no ads on your YouTube videos. Hey, so you're fucking welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're fucking mm -hmm. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> there was also someone on YouTube who said, um, it was what Anna Lee. Do you see that one? I literally did a shit ass job of copying it because we were watching WrestleMania while I was doing that. Who said go to uh, interview the evil Christians at Pride? 
Yeah. So that's actually such a good idea. Um, I think what we would like to do is go to Pride and we have our little um, travel microphones that we can use and just interview bigots. Uh, yeah, I think I'd have to like take a Xanax beforehand um, because I've seen uh, people try to have discourse with them before. I want to raw dog a bigot. You know what I mean? I want to appreciate that for you. I, I want to would... co- go in dry. Um, I think it would put me in a padded room vacation. If I'm being honest, I think I would like go insane from just frustration and broken blood vessels, but I still think it's a good idea. And I still think we should do it. I also still think we're going to do the attending different services. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm giving it a review. I honestly think that that would be super fun because I think that maybe people are super curious about Mormon church if they haven't been here before. Mm. And I also think that we have been, you and I have been very interested in Catholicism lately. Yeah. So, yeah. Cause I know pretty much everything about the Mormons. I, I feel, I actually can say with my chest that I know more than they do, but um, I think, there are other religions, especially Catholicism, that I'm like super interested in learning about. I would also like to um, dip my toes in um, Judaism because they're a religion that I love because they do not actively recruit. They do not want you. It is actually very hard to convert to that religion. I so I do love that as well. Would love to get into Scientology somehow. Probably not now that we've said that live. Yeah, they have they've got us on record for a hot Or maybe minute. like Seventh Day Adventists. Mm-hmm. A little branch Davidian action, maybe. Oh yeah. I mean I mean if there's any if, left after wait. Yeah, up. I was gonna say, are there any um, are there any left? Um I think that there is a Jehovah's witnesses. Yeah. I don't know if you can just go to their church services though. I'm not very educated about that. Yeah, I'm uneducated I'm sure about a lot of things. Yeah. I would also um like to get out of uh like Christianity and venture into some some other religions, honestly. Um we, I go to the pagan market once a month. I bet there's someone down there we could interview. Yeah, let's just We've got our boots on ready to learn and our thinking caps are strapped on tight. So, um, yeah. But anyway, hi, everyone on YouTube. So sorry for fucking cussing. So um, let's start this bitch out. Let's I will say, out. Noelle and I read from a script. That's not a secret. We don't write swear words into the script. They just <laughs> organically <come> out. Naturally. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. It's like the eloquentness at which we frame the podcast really could be child friendly, but then we just come in and ruin it. Uh, yeah, Cause at I, the end of a long day, we're, we're over it. Yeah. I, uh, speaking of profanities before we get into intros, so sorry for these up, up top show notes. Um, when we were at your game this weekend, your husband's superiors were also there enjoying the game and they were asking about rules and how the game is played and why certain things were happening. And your husband was like, will you tell them? And I'm like, yeah, I will. And then I was getting into it, obviously, because I was watching you guys kick ass and some words slipped out. And I didn't realize that that was his um, superiors until I hear him behind me go, watch your profanities. (laughs) You didn't tell me that. He was like, I, I was like, I didn't even know your boss would be there. I wouldn't have come over acting like I needed to poop so bad <laughs> um, and then immediately shake her hand while I was still in like the squat pose. Yeah. Um, and then he was like, well, it's not technically my boss. And I was like, Oh, thank God. He's like, it's my boss's boss. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. worse, oh. the worst type of boss to have there when I'm just like, and you see how she fucking grabbed her arm. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, no, it wasn't that egregious. They were well placed. Um, for the first time in my life, they were well placed yeah. profanities because like I was just like, swear. yeah, I was like, did you see that? That was a fucking back block. We're <laughs> 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 no, gonna get her on those fucking forearms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a shit call. Not <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. 
Well, that's I his toned problem. It down. I toned he it should, down. He should he should know how to explain the rules by now. So really, that's on him. Yeah, like come on. But um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. I yeah. like that. I like that we're like we're not going to go to church anymore. Anyway, we have another religious episode. Hey, so yeah. <laughs> so anyway, back to Christianity. Before <laughs> we get into that, though, hey, what's up? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, what's up? My name's Noel, and <clears throat> I'm not going to do an accent, but. Name five celebrities who got their start in horror movies. Jamie Lee Curtis, John Travolta, Demi Moore, Brooke Shields, and Maxine fucking Minx. Um, the new Maxine trailer came out today. I'm so fucking excited. I really think that um, Mia Goth is the new it girl in horror. She's the new stre- scream queen. This is like a first in a long time horror anthology trilogy series that is just scrum umptious i'm super fucking excited the trailer looks amazing um so yeah i'm i think it's out in july i was too busy enjoying the trailer to even pay attention to the date but um super excited for maxine and i'm chelsea i would have thought of a better thing to say but i know that when noelle talks about movies it's best to shut up and listen because she's about to spit some fire that's the last time you'll ever hear me compliment her thank Um, you so i have nothing else to say but i am excited um for what christianity or maxine uh yeah i i well i hope (laughs) you know i have high hopes i always hope the episode goes well and then once the episode ends i'm always like that's the worst episode we've ever done yeah Every yeah, time. The imposter syndrome uh, is for real. I will say though, before you start this episode, I believe the eclipse energy has made timelines can join. Some people think that deja vu is um a point when two different timeline versions of yourself, like the one you're in currently and a different one, merge together and are experiencing the same thing at the same time. Some people think that's what deja vu is. I feel like that's how I'm thinking today because I scanned through um, Chelsea's notes and I texted her, we've done this. And she was like, um, actually. And I was like, no dude. Like I, I know what you're going to say. Like I, I sat on both our Spotify and also our Instagram. And I went back to when we had a different name and was looking for this fucking shit and it did not exist anywhere. But I swear, if you hooked me up to a live lie detector test right now, I would pass saying that we've already fucking covered this. I remember the three sisters. I remember the three things they were fucking told. I was losing my mind. To be fair, I didn't, um, actually you, what I Why? actually said, um, actually, oh, what? <laughs> what I actually said was, I don't know, haha, did we? I'll die if we did. I don't think we did. <laughs> <It was just laughs> like, <laughs> I also I... searched the Spotify. The problem is, is like sometimes Noel and I start notes for an episode and then the content goes fucking dry and we mm-hmm. abandon them. And this yeah. was an abandoned. Yeah, it was a great episode. It's been abandoned episode. since October of last year. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, fuck, let's just finish it. Um, and then there's also a reality, the current one we're in now, where we used to name shit completely unrelated to anything. So even if you did try to search it, you would not fucking find it. I know. We had no idea what SEO was. We were just having fun for shits and giggles. Yeah. And unfortunately for all of you, a lot of those episodes are about Antarctica and the flat earth. I know. And those are the ones you fucking want so bad. And I'm like, I couldn't tell you where it was. I'm so fucking sorry. So, um, yeah, it's like an yeah. old looking at the titles of our old episodes. I'm like, I wasn't even there. And then I yeah. play it and I like, wait a minute. Cause the episodes are like, save us from the cia like tom holland and i'm like what the fuck was that what even was about? that dude i'm pretty it's- sure that one was about stanley kubrick it doesn't make any sense <laughs> i will say looking back doing that deep dive trying to find this episode looking at our old titles had my butthole puckered so tight from cringe that it almost disintegrated and gave me like a barbie ass dude i was i was yeah. like clenched so tight i was like Oh my god, look at us trying to be so fucking funny. Like, oh man, I'm going to go um commit suicide in front of a public square and change the trajectory of people's lives because I'm so fucking embarrassed right now. Yeah. 
And they're not so. good. Some of them could have been so good. Oh. And I'm like, we wasted that. I know, dude. I know. And like some of the edits I used to do. Oh my God. It literally is like, it's literally. Ugh. <laughs> it's uh, it's like one of these is aliens i guess what the fuck oh i'm gonna oh i can't wait for time travel to be real so i can go back in time and beat the shit out of myself for posting that yeah for thinking that was funny oh i bet it oh i'll curb stomp myself dude i can't wait oh, i can't wait for time travel man i'm gonna beat the shit out of myself yeah what a bummer dude <laughs> So oh, it hurts stupid. to see. It's Especially- so bad. It's so bad, dude. I- we didn't even title our notes back then, so I can't even go back no. to notes. It's like notes. And we used to put our notes in. I used to put the notes in an Excel and not name them. So the Excels are just untitled with a string of text. Also, I'd be like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the way that like we have so many notes to the point where our drive is almost full and Google wants to make us pay and yeah. half of it is unintelligible gobbledygook because we were fucking just <laughs> typing into the ether for no fucking reason. It's crazy, dude. Yeah, It's, it's almost like crazy. how we've spent nearly 30 minutes talking shit <laughs> about nothing. Cook and we... People have yet to even know. <laughs> this is oh. this is class. We're taking it back to our roots, honestly. Yeah, okay, let's back to our roots. Fucking get get into it. Get into the meat and potatoes. Go. Here you go. <laughs> In the mystical landscapes of Portugal, 1917, a story unfolded that would weave itself into the fabric of conspiracy and mystery for decades to come. Three young shepherds, Lucina, oh, I already fucked it up, Lucia Santos, and there her cousins. Go. Jacinta and Francisco Marto were thrust into the arcane when they claimed to have been visited by none other than the Virgin Mary herself. This encounter on a seemingly ordinary spring day, May 13th, was only the beginning. It sparked a series of visits, six in total, culminating in October, where the celestial visitor would later be known affectionately as Our Lady of Fatima. Um, is there a translation for that? Does that have like a special name? Like, why is it Our Lady, Our Lady of Fatima? Like, okay, well, it's Fatima, and that's a municipality in Portugal. Fatima. It's like where, oh, where it all happened. Accent. Yeah, it's just the oh. Lady of the. It'd be like the Lady of Utah, or like the oh. Lady of Salt Lake, or like Lady of Davis County. I guess I got it now. Yeah. I was like, who is she? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the Virgin Mary. She Not another Virgin. Mary I have to fucking figure out who she fucking is. There's only two. God, two too many if you're asking me. Do you but anyway. clean off your glasses? And I know you don't because you have good vision. And they're just dirtier than before. And you're like, am I having... Do I just have cataracts all of a sudden? <laughs> but yeah. it was on July 13th, under the scorching midday sun, that the plot took a turn towards the shadowy. The Virgin Mary imparted three secrets to the children. Veiled mysteries that would stoke the fires of intrigue for generations. The first two secrets were eventually shared by Lucia in 1941 through her writings on Jacinta. But the third secret, mm, that was where the true enigma lay. It remained a closely guarded puzzle, a secret so potent that Lucia hesitated to reveal it, even when pressed by Bishop Jose Alves Correa de Silva. Did you ever take Spanish? I, I took I took about nine years of Spanish, believe it or not. Oh, it's um, really not showing right here. <laughs> I know. Hold on. It's because my glasses were kind of foggy. That's sure. I'm... That's for sure. It, I never I took you... Spanish, so that's why I can't read. Well, in English either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I also have a TBI. So, you know, take it as it will. I don't know why these glasses are so dirty. Keep blaming just... the glasses. I think it's helping. Yeah. Um, It wasn't until the autumn air set in that she finally relented, sealing the words in an envelope with a cryptic instruction, quote, for eyes in 1960. Clarity will dawn then. How I just want to give everyone all the props in the world because I was that meme of the werewolf ripping his clothes off when I would see a Christmas present in the in my mom's (laughs) closet, poorly Uh hidden. And I was Uh like, oh like fighting the urge to like yeah. not open it and i just had to wait like a week i just had to wait but, a, a maybe even a mere five business days and there was a chance that i could just say not even on christmas eve 
maybe even on December 22nd. Oh, so I was actually in your bedroom and I saw something pretty peculiar. And then my mom would have let me open it anyway, because she would have been sick of me asking what it was for hints without, you know, I'd ask for hints, but say, you can't tell me though. Give me yeah. a hint. Give me a hint. Um, and she would say enough and she would just hand it to me. So um, I give them all the credit for just yeah staring at an envelope for a specific date and not even being for tempted decades so You're like, not allowed to be tempted little. in the catholic church i think all they do is have temptation and well, some would say act on it in yeah, very violent some, and horrific ways some would say some would say it so but this is not just a tale of divine prophecy it is a saga woven with threads of mystery power and the eternal human quest for the truth but it beckons us to ask what lies beyond the veil of the official story because within the vast tapestry of such celestial visitations, a curious pattern unveiled itself. Out of the myriad claimed encounters of the Virgin Mary, only a dozen have pierced through the ecclesiastical veil to gain the official sanction of the Catholic Church. This select group of visions, predominantly manifesting between the years 1830 and 1933, quite stand the as, time frame. Yeah, no, <laughs> like just a hundred years. That. Yeah, like just a it was casual be century. Three. Yeah, just a quick century. Um, stands as testament to an era embroiled in the throes of profound upheaval and transformation. Enter Victor and Edith Turner, a duo whose journey into the heart of Catholicism in 1958 marked the beginning of a profound exploration into the cultural and spiritual zeitgeist of their times. With keen eyes and minds attuned to the undercurrents of societal shifts, the Turners proposed a captivating theory. These sporadic yet potent bursts of Marian apparitions were not mere isolated spiritual events, but rather a mirror reflecting the deep-seated anxieties of society caught in the whirlwind of rapid change. I mean, I think this period, like that's, I think that's why we have these even current day pushes to religion or specific ideology it's always a a mirror on what's happening in the world yeah. and in society and, and especially when we have um change we we see these it's the pendulum swing that we always talk about it's yeah. the pendulum swing that we talk about even politically in the united states with how we went from obama to trump um you have one extreme to another yeah agreed um it's yeah it's like how we go towards change and then let's go back to the way it was like, it, yeah, it's even now we're seeing um, society changing from be, like political correctness back mm -hmm. to being a little bit more rancid, which yeah. is a little bit more acceptable, which <sighs> interpret it as you will. I would also say that like, even now, if people really want to fight against religion, I would even say you could copy paste aliens and with a lot of religious phenomenon mm -hmm. of people who are trying to use um, science fiction and things like that to maybe be like, I don't know if I saw the Virgin Mary, but I definitely saw a UFO. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, for so. sure. I also, I don't know if you're going to talk about it, but I, and I hope you do. If not, we'll have to do it in a different episode. But I feel like there was this point in time in the 80s and 90s where there were like Jesus Christ on a piece of toast every other week. And it was like a news story every other week. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, yes. I, I know what you're talking about. No, we are not talking about it in the episode. Well, we'll have to pocket that because we even have one locally where the Virgin, it's the Virgin Mary, right? In the tree in Salt Lake. Yeah. Like what and it became such a non-coined term at the time meme mm -hmm. that you could buy toasters that like burned jesus into a piece of toast because it was like such a phenomenon and i wonder because i remember it in the 90s specifically like what what was happening that made people do that you know what i mean that made people be like i i was in the um I was in church and I saw the Virgin Mary crying, the statue. I saw the Virgin yeah. Mary crying. I saw the statue of Jesus blood coming out of the hand. I mean, like that was, I feel like that was so prominent. Like Reaganomics, like kicked off like the Berlin wall coming down and then oh, that led yeah. into the nineties. I bet that was like a really charged thing. Yeah. Um, and then you I have wonder, shit like Columbine. I wonder if it started with like the cold war. Yeah, I you bet know? it could. Like, I wonder if it could be traced back to, like, the Cold War and then, like, as shit progressed and continued on. 
I would evolved. agree because we're definitely going to get into Russia in this episode. Like, hmm. that would actually be a really cool episode to do religious phenomena surrounding fucking Russia. Which is interesting because they are not allowed to have religion anymore. But, um, yeah, anyway, just a thought I'm going to put but, in the back yeah. of my pocket. <laughs> Um, this era, marked by the by the tumult of revolutions, the clamor for independence, and the seismic shifts in the societal and economic landscapes, provided fertile ground for the seeds of divine encounters to take root. The Turners posited that these visions of Mary, the maternal figure of excellence, served as a celestial reassurance to the faithful, and a beacon of hope and a call to steadfastness amid the swirling ties of modernity. Through this lens, the Marian visions transcend their spiritual significance to become markers of historical and cultural epics, embodying the collective yearning for stability and guidance. As society grappled with the dizzying pace of change, and I would say like the 1830s to 1930s, there's quite a bit going on. Yeah. Oh, that um, quick little hundred years where like people drove fucking cars for the first time. Yeah. And like also like world wars. Yeah. Technology um, booming, world industrialism. Wars, um, Pants, <laughs> like <laughs> with suffrage. Mm -hmm. um, the heavenly interventions of Mary in these times offered a counterpoint to the chaos, which was a reminder to people that there was some sort of divine presence amidst the turmoil of human affairs. And this fascinating interplay between the divine manifestations and the societal zeitgeist invited deeper contemplation into the role of faith and spirituality in navigating the uncharted waters of human progress. The Turner's insights into these Marian apparitions illuminated the enduring human quest for meaning and connection in a rapidly evolving world where the celestial and the terrestrial converge in moments of profound revelation. But let's Keep that in mind and just zoom back on Lucia, who at age 14 was spirit spirited away after the vision of the Virgin Mary visited her. And she wasn't just taken from her home, but was pulled from the world of just being an ordinary shepherd and thrust into a realm of divine mysteries. She was entrusted to the care of the sisters of St. Dorothy in, in Villar, um, which was merely a whisper from Porto, when her journey into the spiritual abyss had only just begun. As the Wheel of Time turned to 1928, Lucia found herself in Tui, Spain, within the hallowed confines of the Dor Dorothinian Sanctuary. But even in sacred seclusion, the visions that had chosen her as their vessel refused to relent. And these weren't mere figments of imagination, but really divine rendezvous that clung to her soul. They demanded to be acknowledged, understood, and ultimately chronicled. And the 1930s obviously brought with them a tidal wave of spiritual urgency. The Bishop of La Laeria, fucking, I hate myself. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> sensing the profound gravity of Lucia's experiences, implored her to put pen to paper. He urged her to unveil the celestial messages that had been entrusted to her and had her create memoirs to document her visions and prophecies. So amidst whispers and veiled glances, Lucia began to unravel the tapestry of the messages she had been given. Drawing inspiration from Melanie Calvet, a visionary who, about a hundred years before Lucia, also found herself entwined in a similar divine narrative, um, Lucia disclosed the first two secrets of the Lady of Fatima in 1941. And these revelations, while profound, were really a prelude to a deeper mystery. And through Lucia's testament, um, we get the first secret of the Lady of Fatima. Do you want to read it, Noel? I guess you're going to make me read. <clears throat> Our Lady showed us a great sea of fire, which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration. What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? So I was using that moment of being muted to drink my tea. A uh, conflagration is an extensive fire. I've okay, sure. I bet she was just a shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard what that word. In my, <laughs> never heard that word in my fucking life. Um, now raised into the air by the flames that issued 
from within themselves together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in a huge fire, without weight or equilibrium, and amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. The demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repulsive likeness, some would say, me as well, (laughs) to frightful and unknown animals, all black and transparent. This vision lasted but an instant. How can we ever be grateful enough to our kind Heavenly Mother, who had already prepared us by promising in the first apparition to take us to heaven? Otherwise, I think we would have died of fear and terror. First of all, nothing here sounds uh, new. This all sounds like your average run-of-the-mill hellfire and brimstone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, like, I would agree. This isn't really, um, that's not a secret. Yeah, it the vision itself serves kind of as a warning and a lesson just in regular Christian doctrine about consequences of sin, reality of hell, as taught mostly by the Catholic church. Um, The imagery used is stark and meant to instill a sense of urgency regarding the importance of living a life in accordance with Christian values, according to such faith. Um, I would argue that it wasn't this, this knowledge wasn't a secret. The secret was what the girls were told. They had so this girl wrote this down and kept it secret. So this was just she let, her describing the scene, not yeah. what she was told. Um, so they get visited. And so this girl gets visited in 1917, mm-hmm. immediately gets whisked away by the Catholic church where she is put into a covenant of nuns. Mm-hmm. She keeps having these visions. And the one of the guys there was like, you have to fucking write these down. She writes down what the Virgin Mary told her in 1917 and seals it. Yeah. Thus creating it a secret. Yeah. Um, people wanted to know what she was told, but she sealed it and was like, don't open this until 1960. And it's for the Pope. So this, but this is just her saying, here's a vision I can tell you about. No, this is one of the secrets. That was revealed in 1960. So again, this is a terrible secret. Everyone already. Yeah, knew. it's like it's like if I told you a secret of like, hey, Noel, I have two dogs. Don't tell anyone for 20 years, and then in 20 years you can be like, Chelsea had two dogs, and people would be like, oh yeah, but that yeah, would. But the fact that you and I didn't tell anyone—that's the secret. The knowledge. I don't think that's how secrets work. I don't know. It's that people wanted to know what <laughs> she was told. I know I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying people wanted to know oh. what this girl was told, and she kept that private. And tell even she though everyone already it. knew it, it wasn't a secret. It's fine. You know what? Well, I mean, during That's that fine. time again, like 1930s, we're like in you know rise of industrialism. We have world wars going on. People want to know, like, what the fuck is the Virgin Mary telling you? She's like, I'm not telling you that she's literally showing me visions of hell. I would have been like, it's something you already know about. Yeah, <laughs> but some would within- say it's not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Reaganomics didn't work. Um, So don't tell anyone. Within the same breath of the celestial encounter, a second secret was imparted upon the children, which like wove prophecies of war and divine retribution into the fabric of their young lives. Noel, go ahead and read that second secret. I hope this is actually a fucking secret this time. You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. I I just feel like that's really conceited if you're like the all forgiving and loving Virgin Mary, like that feels like really egotistical to say. Um Virgin Mary, albeit a saint, is not without sin, Noel. Okay. She's not perfect. Well, you know, these are my writer's notes. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. Oh, I wonder what this is going to be. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pope Pius. What's that? 11? That pontificate 11? of Pope Pius 11. Yeah. yeah. When you see a night illuminated by an unknown light, Oh, a night. (laughs) I was like, girl, what? When you see a night illuminated by an unknown light, 
know that this is the great sign given to you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. Oh, persecutions of the church? Like, we're going back to, like, the witch trials and burning people at the stake? Is that what she means? I, no, I would just say, like, the apocalypse. Okay, well, that's just your interpretation. <laughs> to prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The, I really think she means burned at the stake. The good will be martyred. The Holy Fa Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she shall be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. Let's dive into this a little bit. Yeah, when did she write this? <laughs> um, when did uh, she write this? So she got taken to the uh, nunnery like right after and then while she was there they told her to write it down so sometime after 1917 this little girl wrote it down but it doesn't matter because let's dive into what the second secret is because the second secret really moves from the individual notion of like if you're naughty you go to hell mm -hmm. and moves it into more of a global scale where it intertwines prophecies of war with calls for religious actions it contains and that essentially makes up its two main components, prophecy, call to action. The prophecy part warns about the end of World War I, but it also predicts the outbreak of another potentially more devastating war, obviously World War II, during the papacy of Pius XI. And should humanity continue to offend God um, and if Russia does not convert? The second war is suggested to be preventable through specific religion, religious devotions and actions, indicating a divine intervention mechanism in human affairs. Some well, would obviously say that the second war, war, war would happen, have been yeah. preventable if Germany didn't feel the guilt of failure. Um, yeah, I'm not an expert, but I think... <laughs> I don't even know. I don't um, but think yeah, that... I don't think Germany as a country after world war one, if they just went to church, wouldn't have then done the Holocaust. Yeah. I hate to say it, but I think, I think that this puts more pressure onto Russia, honestly, to help prevent world war two, but I wouldn't even begin to chip away at that fucking block of knowledge without doing more research on how Russia could have prevented it. Um, but the call to action of the second secret really involves a request for the consecration of Russia to the immaculate heart of Mary and the establishment of communion of reparation on first Saturdays. So consecration is really just the action of making something sacred communion of reparation. If that sounds familiar to you, Noel, we've talked about it a little bit um, where somebody has to intend to apologize to the church for the sins that they have committed against women or something that would offend Mary. So like, I would say if you are a, let's just say a rapist converting to Catholicism, I would say you would want to do a communion of reparation. Mm. Um, and that's just saying, sorry. It's just basically, yeah, like I fucked up, but I want to come back into uh, the Catholic church is the Catholic. Is thing. that like, um, you know, a communion of reparation would be you have admitted to sin and then you're given like fucking 10 Hail Marys. Yeah, but this one really, literally, a communion of reparation literally deals with the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So you can go and repent, for example, just like a simple repenting um, is very different than a communion of reparation. It's just like a little, as a non-Catholic, it's hard to explain it, but it's just a, another way to make amends, but it has a little bit more ritual to it. Um, okay, okay. But I would love for someone to explain it to me with more knowledge. Um, but that's it's not really the it's not really the meat of the episode. So I kind of just squeezed over it. Yeah, re it refers to receiving Jesus in Holy Communion with the intention of making reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary for the sins that have pierced her heart 
But Kim- it's like, yeah, it's like so, what the fuck does that mean, girl? Right, what com- Dr. Every, shit was that? Oh, yeah. Every single communion is taking Jesus into you. So that's not unique. It's literally the immaculate heart of Mary that makes it unique. But again, that's like such a Catholic thing. And as a non-Catholic, I would really, maybe we should do like a Catholic vocabulary episode or something. Yeah. That we need so to have a there. glossary because what yeah. the fuck was that? But it, it doesn't matter. We can just move yeah, on. Anyway, it. the text specifically suggests that these actions could lead to Russia's conversion to Catholicism, which would lead to peace and the avoidance of further war and suffering. The failure to heed this call would result in widespread war, persecution of the church, martyrdom of the faithful, suffering of the Pope, which would culminate in various national annihilation. Um, And in historical context, these secrets reflect the anxieties and tumultuous events of the early 20th century, including the rise of atheistic communism in Russia, um, often referred to as errors spreading throughout the world in terms of this specific secret. Yeah. The ongoing and upcoming global conflicts and their perceived threat to the Christian faith and the institutional church. The specific reference to Russia and its consecration can really be seen against the backdrop of the 1917 Russian Revolution and the subsequent establishment of a communist state which was associated with the persecution of religion. Mm -hmm. But let's dive a little bit more into current events, because just like the second secret foretold, Pope Francis consecrated Russia and Ukraine to Mary's Immaculate Heart in 2022, very recently, literally hoping to invoke peace after Russia invaded Ukraine. Now, from a conspiracy theory perspective, this act could be seen as a last-ditch effort to avert the catastrophic future hinted at in the Fatima secrets. Yet, the conflict persists, leading some to wonder if the consecration was too little too late, or if the full requirements of the prophecy have yet to be met. Also, how can you just, like, consecrate them without their consent? (laughs) That seems like... It seems just like the Michael Scott bit in the office of just yelling out the word bankruptcy. Like I well, feel like that's you- literally what consecration is. It's the act of making or declaring something sacred. But like, I don't think Russia was actually declaring anything. The Pope did it. But like, what's the Pope to Russia? A guy? A guy with a hat? I don't. Yeah, so I don't think the Pope is anything to Russia. That's but probably why it didn't fucking work. Catholics, the Pope is everything. So, I mean, you have a you have a different ideological war going on where it's not so much religion versus atheism; it's Catholicism versus communism. I would say. I just like I don't. It doesn't. It's not for us to understand. Okay, Republics. you know what? That's that's fair. Um, The third secret of Fatima, withheld from the public for over half a century, remained a subject of intense speculation and mystery within the Catholic community and beyond. This secret was not penned until January 3rd, 1944, at a time when the world was engulfed in the throes of the Second World War and was then sealed away for future generations. Because she sealed the letter for the Pope's eyes only, And then it would remain a true secret until the revelation of it in the year 2000, which would then open up a Pandora's box of theological debate, conspiracy theories, and endless questioning of divine will. So the text of the third secret as released by the Vatican is as follows. Go ahead, Noel, I'll read that chunk. After the two parts, which I have already explained. (laughs) Weird start. Decades. Oh my God. (laughs) Calm down. (laughs) At the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand, flashing. It gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand, pointing to the earth with his right hand. The angel cried out in a loud voice, penance, penance, penance. And we saw in an immense light, that is God. Something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass it, when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Does that mean the Pope? Yeah. Other bishops, priests, men, and women, religious, religi- religious, religious, <laughs> going up a steep mountain at the top of which there was a big cross. 
of rough hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark before. Yeah. Okay. With the bark before reaching there, the Holy father passed through a big city in ruins and half trembling with halted step afflicted with pain and sorrow. He prayed for the souls of the corpses. He met on his way, having reached the top of the mountain on his knees at the foot of the big cross He was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him and arrows, bitch be fucking for real. And in the same way (laughs) there died one after another, the other bishops, priests, men and women. I assume she means who are religious and various lay people. Okay. Lay people of different ranks and positions beneath the two arms of the cross. There were two angels, each with a crystal, what the fuck is that? Esporium? What the fuck is an asporium? Just sound, sound it out. I sounded it out, but what is an asporium? A basin or other vessel that holds holy water. Cool. In his hands, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. Okay, let's, let's fucking interpret this, right? Because that was a lot. That was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> This vision was interpreted by the Vatican, particularly by Carl Joseph Ratzinger, later Cardinal. Pope Benedict. Yeah, Cardinal. What did I say? Carl. <laughs> <laughs> just, your, just, <laughs> just your average Carl. You want to know what? His son would go on to create Carl's Jr. <laughs> um, later, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, as symbolizing the 20th century's challenges to the faith and to the church, including the persecutions of Christians and the near fatal shooting of Pope John Paul II on May 13th, 1981. That's where they got the Pope mobile. Yep. After that one, the Pope himself attributed his survival to the intervention of the Virgin Mary, linking his experience directly to the miss to the message in prophecy of Fatima. The description of the quote Bishop dressed in white was understood to be a reference to the Pope and the city quote half in ruins could symbolize the trials faced by the church and the world during the tumultuous 20th century. Mm, I feel like that's a bit of a reach. I mean, after like World War II, I guess you could say a city was half in ruins, depending on like where you would go. But yeah. Um, but in the, 1981, the, girl? Yeah. the There was no ruins in 1981. Unless you count Berlin Hall, maybe. I don't know. It's, I mean, maybe. You know what I mean. Uh, yeah. The delayed unveiling of the third secret sparked a wide range of responses from relief amongst those who saw it as a validation of the divine protection over the Pope to disappointment and skepticism amongst others yeah. who suspected that not all had been disclosed. Um, a lot of buildup, a lot of thunder, no lightning, I guess you yeah. could say. Yeah. The latter group speculated that the secret held further implications about the challenges facing the church and humanity perhaps warning of a deep-seated crisis of faith, governance, or spirituality within the Catholic Church itself. And obviously, conspiracy theories flourished, with some believers po- like positing that the full content of the third secret had to have been much more apocaly- apocalyptic in nature than what was revealed, potentially predicting catastrophic events or profound spiritual turmoil within the church. Critics argued that the Vatican's interpretation was way too simplistic or even intentionally misleading, aimed at quelling the speculative frenzy rather than illuminating the true message from Mary. Hey, if there's one thing you can always count on, it's the Catholic Church lying. Yeah, especially like the Vatican coming out and not giving the whole truth. You fucking better believe it. So let's dive into some of those conspiracies now. Um, There's a ton. We're pulling the juiciest ones. Um, first it's the papal assassination attempt and beyond. So while the Vatican interprets that the vision of the Bishop dressed in white being killed is a reference to the assassination attempt on, uh, Pope John Paul II in 1981, conspiracy theorists argue that that description does not even match the events of the day. They point out obviously that the Pope wasn't killed as mm-hmm. the vision suggests, and that the setting of the city in ruins as Noel pointed out, and the killing of other bishops, priests, and lay people amongst the Pope does not correspond what happened, because that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And this discrepancy leads some to theorize that either the text released by the Vatican is incomplete, 
or that it actually refers to a future yet to unfold event involving the Pope and the Catholic Church. I think that that sounds just zesty. That's the most obvious conspiracy of like, yeah. this hasn't happened yet. Yeah, this is lies, fairy tales, and fallacies. Mm-hmm. The second conspiracy is global cat- catastrophe and World War Three. Hey, we're getting so, close. Oh, we're close. Just around the corner. Woo. Another prevalent theory among conspiracy theorists is that the third secret predicts a global catastrophe, possibly World War Three, or a significant natural disaster that would lead to widespread devastation. COVID, maybe. Uh huh. The, the Yellowstone imagery- volcano girl. She's Ooh, a blow. She's a blow maybe. girl. The imagery of a city in ruins and the climatic moment of the Pope being dressed in white, being killed alongside other members of the church are actually to be interpreted as symbols of a worldwide calamity involving both the church and other secular powers. This interpretation often includes that the idea that the consecration of Russia, as requested in the second secret, was actually never properly completed. Oh, oh, why? Because who the fuck is the Pope to Russia? Implying (laughs) that prophesized peace has not been achieved yet and that the world remains at risk. So the only way to stop the apocalypse is to consecrate Russia. Um, And because that hasn't really been done yet, even though the Pope tried it in 2022, some people are like, the math ain't mathin'. Yeah, by trying it, you mean he said, Russia is consecrated. Uh, Bitch, that does not do anything. I feel like people have to participate. Even if it's fake fairy tale magic and bullshit you still have to like participate in the ritual of it well I'm, there, there's got to be ritual if the pope's doing it i mean like have by you ever seen himself? something get blessed well it's just by like when himself. you go to a church and someone starts communion like there's a lot of ritual that goes into it yeah, i would but be like they're not i he was not even in russia when he did that he was in the comforts of his home in his fucking well, we don't know that nuggy doing fucking magic tricks sleight of hand and thought that that would work. Well, I'm fucking looking it up because I we do our research here. Bet his ass was not even close to Russia when he did his little consecration dance. I will guarantee it. I will guarantee that bitch was in his little fucking penthouse apartment with All the right, smoke let's coming fucking out. Figure it out. The consecration in 2022 took place on March 25th during a penitential service at St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. It was a significant gesture aimed at invoking peace, considering uh-huh. the ongoing conflict between Ukraine and uh-huh. Russia. Pope Francis prayed for peace and the conversion of hearts, explicitly mentioning Russia and Ukraine in the act of consecration, which was a call for harmony and healing amidst turmoil. He was in Vatican City, bitch. Oh, you thought this was a bear, bitch? You thought this was a bear? It's Winnie the fucking Pooh. That's what happened here. He was not even close to Russia that whole time. That bitch was in Italy. That bitch was in Italy. The ritual process of an act of consecration, specifically when you want to do a consecration of a nation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, does have a few rituals that you have to do. First, you have to prepare. Leading up to the act of consecration, there could have been a period of fasting (laughs) Um, people faithful may be invited to prepare spiritually, perhaps through confession, prayer, and penance, and they're invited to participate fully in the grace of consecration. Next, you have mass or a liturgical service. This takes place within the context of mass. It's, it's just church. The next is the reading of the act of consecration. This is the central element in the reading of the act of consecration itself, it's a prayer or set of prayers specifically composed for the occasion. Um, the text typically includes a dedication of the person, place, or situation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. There's a blessing, which is next. The ceremony obviously would do that. The Eucharist adoration and benediction. In some instances, the act of consecration is followed or accompanied by the Eucharist adoration and benediction, which offer a faithful time of reflection, adoration, and the reception of blessing. Mm-hmm. Then there's the Marian devotions. Those are saying the rosary. And then there's publication or distribution. So all this to say, if you have been given an apocalyptic warning by a weird little girl a hundred years ago that says consecrate the country of Russia. I think if I was to wear my little hat and my little outfit and be a little guy up in Vatican city with my little totems, I wouldn't not think that I get to like 
stop the apocalypse by just saying out loud, like, and now you are consecrated. I think I would get my ass on a fucking plane, right? Chelsea's literally choking right now. <laughs> She's choking on mute. And you'll, ah, maybe this is why we should record but anyway, uh, video on YouTube. But anyway, um, I feel like the least you can do is get your ass up, get on the private plane. I know you have drop over to Moscow and do a little in secret consecration. Like they don't even, I'm even rescinding my first thought that they have to be active participants. And I'm just saying, if you show up on the land, right. Cause we can interpret it like that. That's what she means by I... the country of Russia. Noel, I don't want to call you a hypocrite. Why? Do but I distinctly remember asking you to curse my ex-brother-in-law and you yeah. defiled a cucumber yeah and buried it yeah in Utah yeah and then my ex-brother-in-law's liver exploded but, in Idaho but and you claimed but that power this is, is that difference. not no. How, what's the difference? The difference. What's the difference. The difference is I am not claiming my power to be from the Christian Virgin Mary. But right? what's but but it insert claiming power specimen here. You invoked a ritual mm -hmm. and expected an outcome. Mm -hmm. Being vast differences apart, and then you said. I am the most powerful person yeah. alive. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you yeah. texted me yeah. when I told you his liver exploded. Yeah. So um, I'm just surprised at the uh, confirmation bias in your yeah. defiling if, of a cucumber. Because there's a difference between a curse and a blessing, right? Is there? Yeah. Ritualistically like on paper, if you were to write out the process between a blessing and a curse, I think the only difference is intention. No, not no, <laughs> not when it comes to blessing a fucking country, bitch. <laughs> if I were to pray for you or if I was to curse you, I would do the exact same thing. I would say either fuck Noel or Noel's the greatest. I wish her well. No, Both because if I was to curse you, I would piss in a cup about it with your name on a piece of paper in the cup and then I would bury it at a dog park. But that's what I'm saying is like, what did he do? Clap he, his hands in his bedroom. He literally did. I've just read you the process of like how there is ritual behind it. There's preparation. You have a service, act of consecration, a blessing, a Eucharist. The Eucharist is like the transubstantiation. Why do I, I just, have to? Why do I have to defend? Catholic I just feel like to you. <laughs> whipping around a rosary does not count for anything. I feel like if you wanted to be real heavy metal about it and be fucking for real, you would take your ass because also I think like the power comes from the ritual itself and their rituals are like a lot of pussy shit. It's a lot of chit chat and a lot of yip yap. And I feel like if you wanted to make a heavy metal consecration of Russia, which has banished religion, you would physically show up on the land and that would like reverse it. Right. I feel like that's I, more powerful than saying it in your bedroom. I would agree it's more punk rock, but I think for the sake of ritual that has been established for hundreds of years, I'm sure they feel it's just fine. Um, it's weird how I will say baptism for the dead that the like Mormons do is a bunch of baloney, but I would but that's buy how I, this type of stuff. But that's how I feel like the same thing. I think like the difference between like clapping your hands in Italy Versus like going to Russia when religion is like banished to consecrate the land of Russia and the people within it is the difference between saying fuck the church and lighting one on fire. Sure. I, I, I won't argue that it's not as punk rock. Well, I, just I say punk rock as like a summary statement to say like powerful, meaningful, intense, yeah with ripple effects and action you would i feel like it's something where it's like you go to a michelin restaurant and they bring you a saltine cracker and you're like what the fuck 
I expected yeah. more. It's like you want more. If this is really something that is supposed to stop the fucking apocalypse, yes, I want boots on the ground. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying there. I want them I to would, spill yeah. blood in Russia. I want him to like, I, cut his hand yeah. open and bleed on the soil of Russia and say, "You are now consecrated into the Catholicism against your fucking will." I want the Pope to full on ash cut his hand off and replace it with a chainsaw shaped like a <laughs> crucifix. And I want him to just go fucking yeah. slice every hammer and sickle in half yeah. that he can. Yeah, that would be, that's a good movie. Um, but- also, a good comic is Battle Pope, but we will move on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the last, not the last conspiracy we're choosing to talk about is the idea of the real third secret. So fueling many conspiracy theories is the belief that the Vatican has not released the full text of the third secret or that there is an entirely different text that remains hidden, the true third secret. Proponents of this theory often cite statements made by individuals who are close to the Fatima events, such as Lucia's niece, who suggested that the real secret was actually written on a single sheet of paper And that Cardinal Ottaviani, who implied that the secret was of a dire, apocalyptic nature, kept it hidden. And this belief in a hidden or altered text suggests that the full extent of the prophecy, which potentially involves dramatic revelations about the future of the church and the world, has actually been suppressed to prevent panic or to protect the Catholic Church's image. Now, really, one can't help but wonder if the apocalyptic scenes described by Lucia, the cities in ruins, the faithful martyred, and a world in the grip of war and despair bear prophetic significance to the turmoil we witness today. I mean, if cities in ruins, Gaza, faithful mm-hmm. being martyred, Gaza, mm-hmm. world in grip of war and despair, anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, the cons- even now, like the conspiracy minded might even see Russia's bold maneuvers and the global response really set a stage for the fulfillment of the Fatima prophecies where the moral and spiritual battlegrounds delineated by the Virgin Mary find the reflection in the geopolitical chessboard of the 21st century and the consecration of Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart could be interpreted as a direct countermeasure to the unfolding prophecy, really just a desperate attempt to steer the world away from the edge of the abyss foreseen by the shepherd children, but only time will tell if we made the right call and only time will tell if we acted in time. I doubt we did because I think that fucking consecration was baloney. So that's what I think about that. <laughs> that's fair. Um, kind of a but fun he- one though. I love it when biblical stuff crosses over into the conspiracy realm i love the idea of that not being the real third secret yeah for me it's almost not even conspiracy anymore to like know that everything that comes out of the catholic diocese is a lie or a half truth or an altered version of reality to make themselves seem better um it's honestly a tale as old as time that religious leaders will have visions in the night when their former beliefs no longer align with what the current consensus of modern society is insert any religious name here. That's just the way it goes. Um, So it also wouldn't surprise me if it's not as nefarious as like a whole conspiracy to like hide us from the real atrocities of these secrets. But um maybe more so putting a uh, like modern spin on what they were. It would be interesting if say we failed at secret two and now we're in the apocalypse and all of these events, like the Winchester brothers and supernatural are just like very barely being circumvented by like battle popes. You know what I mean? That would be cool. But then that implies that, um, that the Pope is out there going fighting the good fight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a bummer because you and I have done this for so long where I never see the heroes being at the top. Mm -hmm. So I have little to no faith that there's anybody fighting for us at the top. Yeah. I just have the confines of religion. 
I just have like a really strong feeling that um, if it all ends up being true, right? And uh, there is a being in the sky that created us and whatever. I just have like a really strong feeling that the institution that protected pedophiles is not the top of his fucking list. I want to chalk up my religious beliefs, not as leaning into like a hero in Catholicism or organized religion, but rather I would like to see it in something like fucking Constantine. Yeah. It's like, that's like a true visionary of what you would want to follow into yeah. religious battle because yes. they're not pious mm-hmm. and pedantic and they're not hiding the molestations behind just bouncing archdiocese from city to city with no mm-hmm. repercussions whatsoever. Yeah. I would like that. Where's yeah. our Constantine? I completely agree with you. I would get behind um a constantine type figure in the holy wars i would if our best god warrior is the clown in the fucking hat who's um playing patty cake with the pedophiles we're fucked we're yeah fucked big time yeah we i would rather follow big time i would rather follow the sugar house wizard in the battle. yeah yeah so. <laughs> uh yeah uh 100 uh and for those who are not from utah there is a man who since as far as time has begun, who is dressed as a wizard with a giant wizard staff with his handmade crystal like necklaces and pendants and other stuff walks. I'm assuming, cause I've seen him everywhere, the entire state of Utah selling this, these goods, but mostly he inhabits sugar house and yeah. he is the wizard of sugar house and he is tried and true and just and fair. So yeah. If you haven't seen him, you haven't lived in sugar house that's the that's me gatekeeping i don't want to gatekeep but that's the standard or you haven't been to liberty park on a sunday either way (laughs) true but but never um, talked to him uh but he seems like a really weird guy yeah i've never purchased any of his trinkets but one day i will honestly maybe soon maybe i'll pull out cash just so when i do run into him which is honestly all the time i see him um i buy one but Speaking of things you can buy, there is a... Did you like that? I did. There is a link tree in all of our bios. We are at Go To Hell Podcast. And we are at Go To Hell Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and more specifically, YouTube. And I will say, our at is Go To Hell Podcast on YouTube, but you need to search Chelsea and Noel, or else you will find... A one episode, one subscriber religious podcast um, of the same name. And that is on us. And please go subscribe to us on YouTube because um, we're not getting monetized because we cuss too much. So you might as well just come and hang out and comment because that's what people do over there and it's fun. So we're at Go to Hell Podcast. I am at Noel Thane. That is at Sith Lard. And while you're there in the link tree in all of our bios, we also have a little thing called Patreon. And here, unlike the Catholic Church, you can give us one single dollar for the entire month, and it'll actually go to super cool things like keeping us alive and not hiding pedophilia. And on our Patreon, we, we had a pedophile gift. once, and we kicked him the fuck we out. Kicked him out, you guys. That's how twenty dollars a month. We he could he n- tried to give us out. twenty fucking dollars in a DM, and I said banned and refunded you motherfucker no we didn't even refund did we i thought i did oh we kept the money hell yeah no i I don't want i said i don't want pedophile money money. (laughs) and i was like wait that's twenty dollars (laughs) though yeah i got rid of it i did i didn't want the pedophile money and that's a promise i will keep till the day i die i am not taking the pedophile money and no pedophiles are allowed here and if you are a pedophile you're gonna get kicked out of patreon sorry not sorry um, but we put out episodes once a week on there. A dollar gets you in. Um, we also have a link to our merch. 100% of proceeds are donated. We also have a link to Kelly Holloran or at Wildwood Owl on Etsy. She makes cool shit for us and she makes cool shit in general. So go check her out. We also have a link to our Discord server. And I don't know why you'd need it, but a link to listen to us, which is anywhere podcasts are heard. So, 
So get the fuck out of here. Uh, yeah, let's get the fuck out of here. I'm gonna go ahead and hail um Gatorade Zero. Mm. I'm gonna go ahead and hail blue Gatorade Zero. Um it's been a really rough time to be a scale that I step on. <laughs> so shout out to everything calorie free that I can enjoy. Uh, I'm going to say hail Constantine. Thanks for being the true North. <laughs> yeah, the only nerds. one. The only one. Can't wait for Constantine too. Okay. Uh, let's get the fuck out of here. All right. Bye. Bye.